In this video, we're going to discuss schizophrenia, including the positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia, and I'll talk about what I mean by that in just a moment, as well as the etiology or the causes of this disorder. So let's begin with a little bit of a general conversation of schizophrenia. The literal translation of the word is a splitting of the mind, taken from the Greek words schizo, meaning splitting, and phrene, meaning psyche or mind. But this is a bit of a misnomer because schizophrenia does not involve split personalities. We would call that dissociative identity disorder, which you've probably heard of as multiple personalities. Rather, schizophrenia refers to a psychological disorder characterized by major disturbances in cognition, emotion, perception, and behavior. And these disturbances tend to be severe. The symptoms of schizophrenia, which again we'll learn about in this video, often impair a person's ability to function day to day, even to do simple things, and can frequently result in hospitalization. So it's a very serious disorder that we're talking about here. The lifetime prevalence of schizophrenia is about 1%, meaning that 1% of people uh, in the world will meet the criteria for the disorder at some point in their lifetimes. So next, let's discuss the symptoms of schizophrenia, which as you probably notice, can be either positive or negative. And I wanna pause with an important note here. As was the case for terms like positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement that we learned about before, positive and negative do not mean good or bad. Instead, positive means an addition of something, whereas negative means a subtraction or the absence of something. So the positive symptoms of schizophrenia then refer to an addition or an excess of atypical behaviors, emotions, or drives, whereas the negative symptoms of schizophrenia refer to an absence or a decrease of typical behaviors, emotions, or drives. So let's start by discussing those positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Number one, hallucinations. These are subjectively compelling but false perceptions. And you'll see why perceptions is italicized here in just a moment. So these are subjectively compelling. The person truly believes that they're seeing this or they're hearing this. I'll note that hallucinations are typically auditory, meaning something they're hearing that isn't really there. At least two thirds of the time we see that they're auditory, but they can be visual or olfactory relating to smell as well. So olfactory means you're smelling something that's not there. We also have delusions, which are commonly mistaken for hallucinations. These are subjectively compelling but false beliefs, and there are multiple types of delusions that I think it would be helpful to uh, discuss. Number one, paranoid delusions. These are delusions that involve the false belief that other people or agencies are trying to harm you, like you believe the FBI is after you, that kind of a thing. Second, we have grandiose delusions beliefs that you hold some kind of a special power, unique knowledge, or you're otherwise extremely, extremely important. Maybe you think you're the Messiah, something like that. That's a grandiose delusion. And finally, somatic delusions. We've seen this word soma multiple times. For example, way back when talking about the cell body of a neuron, the soma. Somatic delusions are beliefs that something highly abnormal is happening to your body. For example, that spiders are laying eggs in your lungs. So hopefully you can see how any of these would be really, really distressing. Again, a severe uh, problem here. We also see disorganized behavior. These are unusual behaviors, and there are lots of different examples, but maybe repeated useless movements that aren't really accomplishing anything, or excessive giggling, or excessive facial expressions, really extreme facial expressions. That's disorganized behavior. And finally, disorganized speech rambling, exhibiting loose associations, which is a term we use to mean uh, rapidly shifting from talking about one thing to talking about something else, which is basically revealing disorganized cognition through what they're saying. So those are the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Now let's discuss the negative ones. First, flat affect, a lack of emotion. Affect meaning emotion and flat meaning they're not really displaying any emotion. Again, this is a negative symptom because it's a lack of, it's an absence, it's a reduction in emotion. Second, elogia, which is a lack of speech. Maybe they're talking very, very softly or not at all. A volition is a lack of motivation or goals. They're wandering around aimlessly. They don't really have any purpose. Uh, again, lack of emotion, lack of goals. Because this is a lack, it's a negative symptom. 
asociality, a lack of social interest, not really interested in people around you, what they're doing, what they're saying. And finally, anhedonia, which we've learned about before in regards to anxiety and mood disorders. Anhedonia is an inability to experience pleasure, even from things that normally would grant a person pleasure. I'll mention one more thing, which is that related to disorganized behavior, which we mentioned a few moments ago as a positive symptom of schizophrenia, we sometimes see an extreme form of disorganized behavior known as catatonic behavior. Catatonic behavior is minimal reactivity to your environment. For example, maybe you're holding a rigid posture with your body for a really long period of time and not really interacting with anything outside yourself. So I'll note again, just to make it really clear, that catatonic behaviors represent an absence or a reduction in movement, so we would consider that to be a negative symptom of schizophrenia. Now, although not in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM, some clinicians may refer to different subtypes of schizophrenia that are based on the types of symptoms the person has. For example, Paranoid schizophrenia, an unofficial subtype of schizophrenia in which the primary symptoms exhibited are those hallucinations and delusions. Also disorganized schizophrenia, in which the primary symptoms here are disorganized thoughts, behaviors, and speech. And catatonic uh, schizophrenia, where again you're seeing those catatonic behaviors, which I'll note are extremely rare and typically they're the result of the progression of an untreated schizophrenia disorder for a very long period of time, but we don't see it too often. Let's end by discussing the etiology, again, the causes of schizophrenia. As we saw in a previous video, the more genes you share with a person who has schizophrenia, the more likely it is that you'll develop it. And this suggests a significant genetic component to the development and perhaps perpetuation of schizophrenia as well. So genetics seem to play a role. There's other biological components as well. For example, neurotransmitter differences in people with schizophrenia. The dopamine hypothesis proposes that schizophrenia is caused by an overabundance of dopamine, one particular neurotransmitter, or too many dopamine receptors. And we find this very consistently, so we think it's related. Also, we see differences in brain anatomy with people who have schizophrenia, for example, enlarged uh, ventricles compared to typical others. But also environmental factors, such as events during pregnancy. I can give you all kinds of examples of this, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that any of the following that I'll mention in a moment are associated with the development of schizophrenia. If the mother, for example, has extreme difficulty during labor, they, uh, the child has an increased risk for developing schizophrenia. The mother uh, getting the flu in the first trimester of pregnancy, that's associated as well. And also if the mother is under extreme stress, and I'm not talking about everyday stress, I'm talking about the loss of a loved one, right? The death of a loved one. That level of stress, again, increases the risk that the child will develop schizophrenia. And finally, there's some evidence to suggest that marijuana usage is associated with schizophrenia as well, and longitudinal studies suggest that this is a causal and not just a correlational influence.